The product rule for differentiation has a formula, but the question is, where did that formula come from? Why does it look the way it does? Let's find out as today we're going to try and prove it. Right then, yes, I am hyped because today we're doing the proof of the product rule. And I must admit, I find the product rule quite a neat technique anyway. But then the fact we're doing the proof of it, the proof is quite cool as well. So I'm genuinely looking forward to doing this one. Of course, the product rule is this idea of if we have a function that can be expressed as something times by something else, people often write that as y equals u times by v, then dy over dx, the derivative of that function will be du over dx times by v plus u times by dv over dx. But before we continue on any further, of course, I must say that you don't need to know this proof for the A-level exam. So if any moment in this video you're looking at what's going on going, I have no idea what's going on. Don't sweat about it because you don't need to know this stuff for an exam. It's just for fun. Uh, but equally at the same time, if you don't un understand anything that's in this video, please do ask me in the comments section. I'm happy to explain stuff more because it probably means I've just skipped over something in my explanation. Uh, so with all that said, what are we going to need to, in order to be able to do this proof? Well, one of the major things we're going to need to do is realize because this is a proof that involves differentiation, it's important that we go back to basically the structural foundation of differentiation, which is differentiation by first principles. So we're going to need to use that. But then if we're using that, we're using a limit notation. And therefore, we're going to need to understand a couple of important properties to do with limit notation. Uh, as part of that, it's worth pointing out we're only dealing with finite limits in this proof, and that's partly why we're able to use these quite neat uh, tricks as part of limit notation, um, and it means we can avoid dealing with the whole complicated world of infinity in general. So the first of those properties is if we've got the sum of two functions and then we're doing the limit of them, then that's the same as doing the limit of the individual functions and then doing the adding later. Cool, pretty neat. And then the other property we need to use is if we got two functions multiplied together and then we're taking the limit of that, then that's the same as doing the limit of the individual functions and then multiplying that together later, as long as we're dealing with finite limits only. So therefore, that is very useful uh, in case you're looking at those properties, uh, because you might not have used limit notation much before in your previous experience. And you're wondering what the hell's going on there. Uh, a reminder that limit notation is this idea of instead of just directly plugging a number into something, what you're doing is you're adjusting your letter, your variable, uh, and seeing what happens to it as you change the number inside, approaching a particular number that you've specified in the limit notation. So in reality is a lot of the, the meaning behind limits and how that the, they work in terms of how we can manipulate them is ultimately just going back to intuitive stuff you do all the time whenever you're plugging numbers into stuff that you often do without thinking. And so it's just formalizing some of those things we do all the time with that stuff. And then the last thing we need is a special trick that for the moment will remain a mystery, but we'll reveal it very soon. And if you are looking for, if ever, an origin story, if you will, of this entire series, this little trick is it. Because if you ask me to do pretty much any of the other proofs that are in this series on the spot, I'd be able to do it. Not because I know them all off by heart, but just because they all just generally just algebra and a bit of problem solving to get where you need to. Um, but this proof requires this little trick. And I must admit, although this was something I originally saw years and years and years ago, um, a few years ago, now a student on the spot in class, we're probably doing product rule, I think, at the time, asked me, what is the proof of product rule? And I don't like to lie to students ever. I was very honest and said, you know what? I remember it requires a trick, but for the life of me, I can't remember what that trick is. So I said, you know what? I'll make a video on that later today, and therefore you can see how to do the proof later this evening. Uh, ironically, the act of doing that video then has meant that I do now remember that trick forever, but um, therefore it was quite useful to make that video because uh, it could be nice and informative. Um, but therefore, it's worth pointing out this video isn't that original video. Um, that original video was done with a much worse microphone and uh, also I wanted to make it fit in with the sort of style I've been doing for all the other proof it videos. So this is me redoing that video here today. Partly because, as I said, I like this proof anyway, an excuse to look at it again. I'm not complaining. 
So, uh, with all that said, sorry, very rambly intro, let's get on with the proof. The first thing we're going to do is deal, look at the function we're dealing with, and that would be y equals u times by v, but I'm going to write that using function notation, just because as part of differentiation by first principles, use function notation, because it's a useful notation that allows you to see not just what the functions are, but what you're plugging into them. Cool. So now we need to differentiate that, and in order to differentiate it, we'll use differentiation by first principles, which means first plugging x plus h into the functions, then just taking away the function in its original state, and then dividing all that by h, and then doing the limit of that as h tends to zero. The problem is at this stage, you're then looking at that going, well, what the hell am I gonna do with that now? I don't know how to simplify that. Where does all the stuff from the proof rule come from in that? This is where the trick comes in. And the trick is this. If you add something and then immediately take it away, what you've done is effectively added zero onto something because the add and the take away of the same thing will just cancel out immediately. And the same thing is true if you subtract that same thing and then add it on instead. I just switch the order. Again, they'll cancel out and it's the same as adding zero onto something. And adding zero is good because it does nothing to something, so it's something you're allowed to do as part of algebra rewriting, because you effectively aren't really changing what's going on. And so therefore, we're going to use that to our advantage now, because what we're going to do is we're going to take away u of x times by v of x plus h, and then immediately add on u of x times by v of x plus h, because doing that means we've effectively added zero. So therefore, doing that to our expression we've currently got inside the limit, what we're going to do is we're going to specifically paste this stuff in the middle of the numerator, which will get us something that looks like this. Which, I must admit, you're probably looking at this stage going, oh my god, why has that been helpful? I've just made it look worse, surely? Well, you shall see, because now we've got a plus in the numerator, which will allow us to split this one big fraction up into two mini fractions based on how addition works with fractions. The first fraction is going to have this as its numerator, and then separately we're going to add on a fraction which has this as its numerator. They'll both have a denominator of h, again just because of how fraction addition works, but then because we're adding two separate fractions together inside this limit notation, we can then also separately now look at those as two separate limits using one of the property of limits that we talked about just a few moments ago. So therefore, that gets us this. Cool. But why is that helpful? Well now, in both of those fractions, we've got some stuff that we can factorize. In the first fraction, in the numerator, you might notice there's a v of x plus h appearing everywhere. So that means we can factorize it out the front. So, let's do that. And then also in the second fraction, we've got a u of x appearing in both things in the numerator. So we can also factorize u of x out of everything in that fraction too. So doing both of those factorizations, we get this. But then, because inside those two limits, we have something times by something else, um, then we can also now view that as taking the limits of those two individual things and then multiplying them together. So we get this. And this is the ultimate step we needed to now prove the product rule. Because if we look at the individual things that we've got here, everything we need has now appeared. If we look at that first thing we've got, it looks a bit weird, but if you think back to differentiation by first principles, you realize that that is literally just the formula for differentiation by first principles but for the function of u of x. So therefore this is u of x differentiated, called u prime of x. And then the second limit, well, that looks a bit weird. We're making h tend towards zero. If we do that, then the x plus h will tend towards just x. It'll tend towards x plus zero effectively. So therefore v of x plus h will just become v of x. Cool. And then we've got the next limit to deal with, the limit of the limit as h tends to zero of u of x. But wait a minute, there is no h involved anywhere there. So therefore, u of x kind of doesn't really care what's happening to h because there's no h to affect. So therefore, that will just become add u of x. And then lastly, the last limit we're dealing with there, well, again, you look at that and recognize it and realize 
it's just the differentiation by first principles formula for v of x. So that's going to be v prime of x. And what do you know? This is just the product rule because the u prime is effective du over dx converting back to derivative notation. v of x is just v, u of x was just u, and then v prime of x was just the derivative of v, dv over dx. And we've done it. That is the proof behind product rule, and that's why it works. You can see why uh, perhaps you uh, wouldn't have come up with this yourself. I certainly wouldn't have uh, because of that little trick. Um, but then once you know the trick, it is quite neat how it all falls into place. Now, some of you might be wondering why I was saying earlier, you know, we didn't have to deal with infinity with all this stuff. Well, it's because generally if you're dealing with infinite gradient, You've got, you've got weird dodgy stuff happening anyway because of course gradient is the change in y over the change in x and if you've got perfectly vertical gradient there's no change in x and that's what you're talking about if you've got infinite inverted commas gradient so therefore it just doesn't make sense to be talking about anyway uh, in the context of gradients so that's why we didn't need to deal with any infinity limits in this stuff okay then hopefully you found that interesting i certainly did I hope to see you in a future video, and here are some links to some of my other videos.